Take 90 minutes to yourself. Think about what you want. Write it out on any axis, anything that comes to mind. What do you want out of life? And if it's helpful, what do you want to have done by the end of your life? Edit that down as much as you want and then share it with three closest people who are going to give you good feedback. So that doesn't necessarily mean your mom or your best friend who's always going to love you and all these other things. But it does mean the friends who are like what I would consider real friends who are going to be direct with you and not give you feedback like good or bad, but like challenge you on it or at least are going to be good friends in the future to push you towards whatever that that goal is, which might change. But at least for now, they're going to help you out in the next two to three years. That's the smallest thing you can do to better yourself. I am particularly excited to talk to you because you sold your company for $200 million. Yeah. And that's a pretty crazy thing. And I still look like this. <laughs> and I still wear these clothes. You lost 40 pounds, though, which I'm sure we'll talk well, about at some point. The, the total amount is higher. That's crazy. But yeah, well, we can get into that, especially since I now know your personal trainer passed. <laughs> so you sell the company for $200 million. Yeah. What do you do the next day? Uh, go to work. That's really what happens. And that's the weird part of like selling a company is there's a lot of different types of people who listen to this podcast, but there's a certain, you know, subset of entrepreneurs that I'm in that uh, you just kind of feel like nothing <laughs> to be, to be really frank with you. I, I've had the, you know, the honor and privilege to have achieved a couple things, you know, in, in my life, like some hard things, if you will. And the unfortunate or fortunate kind of outlook is I felt hey, if I did it, it must not have been that hard. So what's all the fuss about, right? Which probably is overall unhealthy, but that's just who I am. So can't really do much about it. But yeah, it just didn't feel much. The money hit the account. Um, everyone else starts treating you like a god to the point where you're like, am I a god? Like, what's going on here? Uh, and that actually causes a little bit of a crash because I think entrepreneurship is one of the best self-help programs you can ever do. Uh, cause you get kicked in the face all the time. It doesn't matter if you're trying to build a software company, e-commerce company, like a local barber shop, whatever it is. Um, there's just so many ups and downs. So you get really, really good at being even keeled. And then all of a sudden when the money hits, you're still even keeled. Um, you recognize it as a good thing. And then all of a sudden people boost you up and then the imposter syndrome kind of kicks in and you go, wait, was it a fluke? Can I do it again? Uh, do I want to do it again? Oh my God. I fear death now. I've never feared death in my life. Uh, because I fear I built this up. I have this like thing to invest or to do good things with. And now am I going to be around in order to, to do it? And then all of a sudden you're like, wait, am I going to be bad at being rich? Like, how do you rich? How does that even work? Right. And so you have all this like build up and then this like fall down and then you eventually come out to, to center if we can get into if you want. But yeah, it was, it was, it was an interesting, you know, kind of month and really just an interesting past year. What was the lowest of the lows? Ooh, I think the lowest, thankfully the, the self-help program of entrepreneurship had, had worked a lot. Um, for those who don't know me, like I, I'm an incredibly insecure person. Um, and I used to think that that was strength. I used to think that was fuel. I actually think that insecurity is one of those things that is an opportunity that most of us don't take. Um, we relish and we kind of cuddle with that insecurity rather than getting past it. Um, but we can get into that if it's interesting. But I think for me, thankfully, I had shed a lot of the insecurity or some of the insecurity that I had had. The lowest of the low, there were, there were two lows. The first low was getting to a point where I felt like I had lost purpose. What I found in the last year was I am very comfortable and I really, really enjoy when I have a wall that needs to be punched through, that needs to be climbed over, that needs to be gotten around. This is not a really uncommon you know, feeling or, or um, psyche to have. But all of a sudden, I had lost my wall. Or maybe to put it better, my wall had expanded to, you know, paddle this, you know, company that bought us. We're now all sharing this wall and my purpose or where I was supposed to go in that wall had now really, really changed. And so that caused a lot of, um, I think existential crisis is probably a little bit dramatic, but it caused a lot of existential questions of like, well, my purpose is now not here. Um, where is my purpose? You know, now where do I have to shift it? And this is why a lot of entrepreneurs post-exit, and this is one of the reasons why I wanted to go on with the company that bought us, was because a lot of entrepreneurs who just kind of hand over the keys, um, 
a lot of them become drug addicts. A lot of them become alcoholics because that purpose is the, the thing that they lost. And then the other kind of low, um, which is kind of a little bit more of a fun one, uh, was I went through this, like, what I call the false peak of cocaine energy, um, which I've never done drugs, so I'm just imagining what cocaine feels like. But um, And that's mainly because I have this deep-seated fear that I have to go work for the government again, so I can't do drugs because they won't accept me then, which is insane, right? But um, I had this, like, this, this, like, crazy energy of, well, I have all this optionality. I can go do all these things. I hired 17 people uh, to go just do research and do just like crazy different things. I bought 19 gas stations. That was like an actual smart thing that I did. But this was kind of a lull because I was just like going in all these different directions. Um, and then, you know, thankfully I have good friends who kind of even me out, not necessarily directly, but just indirectly through talking to them. Um, and then I, you know, I did a couple other things that might be interesting to talk through where I hired a psychiatrist to interview all of my friends and interview my family um, to kind of like get out of this. And then, you know, I, I launched this giant study to figure out like what makes rich people happy. Like I paid, you know, 50 grand for the study, which is kind of insane to really think about. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that was kind of the low moment. Those two those two pieces, basically. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing those. Yeah. I want to talk about the psychiatry experiment you yeah. did where you hired the psychiatrist to interview 10 of your closest people in your life. Sure. What was that like? How did you go about doing that? So it's really important. Like know thyself is this thing that we talk a lot about. And I am from the school of thought that you can know yourself better than others can know you. Uh, with enough introspection. I think other people disagree with that for a lot of valid or maybe I would think invalid reasons. But for me, when I started going through a bit of this low, and again, this is a champagne problem cycle. This is not something where I'm worried about anything super crazy and it's not like there were tears or anything you know, dramatic like that. But you're going through this low and probably the healthiest thing to do would be to have a pastor or have some sort of spiritual advisor that you can go to but, you know, being someone who optimizes the hell out of everything, I started going into a place where, um, one, I, you know, basically was like, well, what's the, the fastest way and the deepest way I can solve this? One way is what I kind of mentioned, which was like, well, let's go figure out what happiness actually looks like. Because every study, when you look at happiness and money, it just doesn't include wealthy people because they're a lot harder to get collect on. And my entire career had been about market research up until this point, not only in terms of building the company, but also in terms of like pushing forward, you know, just the products that we actually sold. And so this is why I launched that study, because it's like, well, I could just go do primary research and figure this out. I have the means now. I have, you know, higher research budget basically than most universities, which is kind of crazy. And then the psychiatrist was, well, this is a professional person who, you know, I picked a very old psychiatrist because I didn't want to deal with like the 30 year old who is probably very, very good, but we're going to go through eight sessions to get to one little nugget of fact. So, you know, this guy's named Jack. He's phenomenal. Other entrepreneurs have used him. Um, he's 74 years old. So to the point where I was like, am I going to get all my sessions? I don't know. I'm just kidding. Um, he seems very healthy, but he's just a no BS kind of person. So he interviewed the 10 closest people to me. Uh, he's not you know, he's not someone who like faffs around. He like asked them a bunch of things about me. He did it anonymously, meaning I don't know exactly. I know what everyone said, but I don't know who said what. He had me take a bunch of different personality exams. Um, he had me, you know, we went through a bunch of sessions and then we did additional exams. Um, and it was really, really fascinating. Um, I found out a lot of stuff that I probably already knew, but it just gave me language and context to it. Um, and it also, I think, was one of the best things to kind of like take this very kind of non-purpose part of my life and kind of give me some language that I can kind of grasp onto what the hell's happening. Um, things like, and I'm happy to go as deep as you want into this, things like um, I, uh, it, it might be hard to believe as you've done some of the research here, but like I wasn't able to admit that I was smart until six, seven months ago. Um, I, you know, come from a pretty blue collar place in Wisconsin more cows than people. My dad's smart, but I think, you know, I got a lot of baggage with my father, um, you know, from, from growing up. And I think what happened there is, um, actually, if you don't mind, I'm going to, I can tell a really fascinating story. Um, I don't think it's that fascinating actually, maybe, but to me, it's really fascinating. One of the most like seminal things that happened in my life was I took basically an aptitude test, like a standard aptitude test that we all took in elementary school. 
I took this when I was nine um, and I scored really, really high on it. And so what ended up happening is all of a sudden I got this like affirmation that I was like somewhat special, right? Well, my father, who's, you know, blue collar guy, really smart, kind of guy who like comes up with the Pythagorean theorem on his own to like basically build houses and he's like he doesn't know what he did but he's like oh this like makes sense like let's do it this way right so like a very practical smart guy but you know probably a little bit lacking in the emotional intelligence like you know world and I don't want to speak ill of my father there's a lot of fun baggage there in general but what was really interesting is all of a sudden I got this like somewhat proof and affirmation from school that I was smart got really good grades all this other fun stuff but my father, who probably didn't understand how to like deal with a smart kid and had this like fear of messing it up, um, went overkill in like probably a really negative way. Um, physical abuse, verbal abuse, these types of things. And, you know, all well-intentioned, I, I can, you know, probably say at this particular point, um, probably didn't know how to deal with his own anger as well. I don't want to, you know, speak too broadly here um, as he's not here. But so I had this like, this weird oscillation between I'm special and in my schooling I'm special and then at home this like bastion of person who's supposed to give me love like can't even say I love you is worried like that I'm going to mess things up is worried he's going to mess things up and because anger is a secondary emotion he's manifesting all this in some sort of anger and all of a sudden I have this like dichotomy right and I bring this up because a lot of entrepreneurs have this you have this like I'm special but I don't understand why and like oh my god I'm a failure. I suck so much. And a lot of entrepreneurship is riding the precipice between those two things. Well, the way that this manifested with Jack, to bring it back to this psychiatrist, is I take this test, this, you know, first this, like, it's how they diagnose a lot of clinical, you know, issues. And I score really, really high on this concept of self-importance, like meaning I'm special. I have something here. Therefore, I, I must, you know, move forward and I must take on a big dragon and I must go do this thing. And then I score really, really high on depressive, which is basically like nothing is ever good enough. And it doesn't mean I have depression or it doesn't mean I have narcissism. It just means that like, these are the two big traits that drive me. And realizing that was really, really, really powerful because all of a sudden it made the last, you know, 30 some years all in context of like, oh, this is why whenever we win something or whenever we succeed, I'm like, what's next? Like, or we could have done better with this, right? Which is a very, very common entrepreneurial kind of reaction to things. But it's also one of those things that like when we sold the company and I'm sitting there and I'm like, well, if this, if this was, you know, it couldn't have been that hard because I did it. And now I'm like trying to go after that next thing. Right. And so, yeah, it, it was a really, really fascinating exercise. Um, the other story, bringing back to the smart thing to kind of close that loop is, um, he had me take an IQ test, just a common IQ test. So I take the IQ test. I score, you know, relatively high. How high? Uh, I'm not, I, I, this gets into weird. I, I'm not going to, I scored very high. Um, and he has me take this test. And my reaction was, and this is the depressive coming out. That test has bias because of X, Y, Z. So he goes, take the other two. So I take the other two tests. And all of a sudden I score, you know, there's always variance, but I score, you know, at the same, you know, at the same level, essentially. And I was like, he, and, and basically came to this head where it's like, okay, so you can have this like mental block that basically says, hey, you're, you're an idiot. You're never good enough. Like having that like father, you know, kind of from when I was, you know, a young kid kind of like always be in your head or you can just accept this. And it doesn't mean you're good or bad. It doesn't, there's no judgment in what we're finding out. It just means who you are. And so then I was able to be like, oh yeah, I am smart. You know, that type of a thing. And so that's what was so powerful. And I'm going a little all over the place here, but that was what's so powerful about that experience was basically having this mirror in Jack and, you know, some of the other folks that, that I worked with during this and basically having that mirror to be like, Hey, here's who you are. doesn't make you good. doesn't make you bad. It just means who you are. And you can either, this was my favorite part. I asked Jack, cause there were a number of different things that came out of this too, which was like every partner that I've had, like relationship, girlfriend, the reason most of them fail, uh, because obviously they failed until, you know, I found my wife, but the reason that they, they, most of them failed is I was getting someone who I was trying to find someone who challenged me intellectually. And what ended up happening with a lot of those relationships is I, we got bored. I got bored of them. They got bored of me. And it was like, then what are we doing here? Right. And that would manifest in fights and these types of things. But my wife, she's someone who like, we don't, we're not like an intellectual challenging partnership. Right. It doesn't mean like 
I'm smarter or she's smarter or anything like that. It just literally means that that's not what our relationship is for. Our relationship is for pushing each other. Our relationship is for growing with one another. But I don't get that from her and she doesn't get that from me, this intellectual stimulation. That's not why we coexist with one another. And realizing that got me a little scared because I was like, oh, like, is this something that I need to change? Like, because there's other relationships where that's exactly what they get from one, right? And Jack, every time I ask one of those questions, like, is this something I need to change? He's just like, this, this is just who you are. It's not good or bad. It's just who you are, right? And I think that that really, really helped because at the end of it, he was like, well, you can go spend the next 15 years trying to rewire yourself. Everyone's capable of change with enough time, effort, et cetera. But there's nothing here where you need to. Why don't you just pick your spots? Why don't you just pick your people? All kinds of fun stuff. And it also helped me with my friends. I think that I'm a little bit of a knowledge vampire, I found out, where basically, um, like, not deep friends, but those second degree or third degree friends, I get very, very close to them until I, like, learn so much from them. And as soon as I stop learning from them, I just get distant. Not because I'm not loyal to them. That's because I don't like them. It's not because I wouldn't do anything or there's something I would or wouldn't do for them. It's just literally, like, no longer intellectually stimulating. So like I move on and this is why it explained like my business partner Facundo and I, we get along so well because like we're always challenging each other intellectually. And so long story short, a lot of little learnings for myself. And it was a very, very like when I look back 10, 15 years from now, just going through this process is something that's like definitely going to change me for the next, the next thing and the next trajectory. Wow. It's really interesting how you got a mirror held up to you yeah. and then that impacts your behavior. What was the biggest thing you changed from learning all of that? Accepting who I am. And why was it difficult for you to accept who you were before? Well, Self-esteem is the key to acceptance. And when you weren't given or developed a self-esteem as a kid, or you didn't know where that came from, right? It's really, really hard to accept yourself. And I don't blame my parents. They were doing the best they could. My mom worked her butt off in order to give me that self-esteem. But that mixture of all these like competing messages didn't develop my self-esteem. And then there's a bunch of different things that like came with that. Like, you know, I was a fat kid. I, you know, grew up poor. I didn't always have all, like there's a bunch of these different things that, that like worked against that build of that esteem and you don't need money or to be skinny to, to develop self-esteem. That's not what I'm saying. But there's a bunch of these different things that fought against that. And developing that self-esteem, and I had a lot of hacks to do this over the years. I have this framework called scoreboard that I use. There's a bunch of different things that I do kept that self-esteem incrementally going up. But this was a capstone that was just like, listen, you have a professional person. Maybe he's not the best psychiatrist in the world, but he's done this long enough. He's done this with enough people. You have taken a battery of exams. You've added all of this to your scoreboard where you've sold a company for this much. You, you know, I graduated first in my class in college without working that hard. I won a national title in debate. I did, there's a number of these things. I'm not trying to be braggadocious. Just there's a number of, there's some clear evidence. And when you have that, not only that clear evidence, but you also have the feedback cycle of a professional basically stamping and saying, this is who you are. And there's a lot of little cracks that you can get around that. All of a sudden it's like, well, why shouldn't I have self-esteem? Like, why, why am I not good enough? And when you have that, all of a sudden that comes and creates acceptance. So now it's just this development of, well, it isn't good or bad. It's just who I am. And that doesn't mean someone else is worse. It doesn't mean someone else is better. It just means this, this is who I am. And this is just the path now I'm going to lead. And that doesn't mean you get rid of all doubt. Like you definitely get, get a lot of doubt in terms of, is this the right path or is this the wrong path? But it does create this environment where you're like, I'm not going to not go down a particular path because I don't think I'm good enough. I know I'm good enough. So I'm going to go down that particular path and I'm going to fail for a bunch of different reasons or I'm going to succeed for a bunch of different reasons, but it's not going to be me. Do you think that 
Jack giving you that stamp of approval and that mirror for who you were was the first time you felt love or acceptance for yourself? Maybe. I think that I found a partner in Jenny who loves me more than I love myself, which is a very dangerous game when you're finding a partner. Uh, Cause you don't get it. And I, like, to a certain extent, I don't understand why she loves me so much, but she does. And it's great. It's awesome. I got lucky. Right. But I think it's one of those things where, um, we all have our pursuits to get and maintain our self-esteem and maintain the acceptance of ourselves. I needed to come at it from an intellectual angle and I'd never come at it from an intellectual angle, but those intellectual angles are what gets me on board with mostly everything. Right. And so we, we all seek our truths in different ways. Um, and for me, seeking this particular truth just required this path. And so, yeah, I think the short answer is probably yes. I'll take my maybe to a yes, but it's one of those things that it, 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 it's not necessarily the path for everyone. Yeah. What would you say to people who are trying to now chase the $200 million exit for something that they're building in, the, in their own lives, but they don't feel the acceptance for themselves? Do you wish in some sense that you had it to begin with? And is that in some sense more important than the $200 million? Interesting. I think if you take a step back for, for a minute, th there's two big things to understand here. The first really, really big thing is we as a society do not do enough exploration around what do you want? If you're listening to the Danny Miranda podcast, you are in a privileged luxury position. You're not digging ditches. You're not struggling. You're, you're probably struggling on like, I want this goal or I want that goal or I want to buy this or I don't want to buy that or this person's sick or I need to afford this. But you're not globally struggling. You have been given the choice and the privilege and the opportunity to actually choose what the hell you want to do. And I think one of the failures that a lot of us, you know, have had in our life is that no teacher, no mentor, no person has sat down and said, well, what do you want? Like, what's the goal here? And if you spend 45 minutes, I, I did this recently with, with Jenny, actually, because we sat down and we've, we've skipped a number of levels. Um, before, you know, the, the, the sale, I had $19,000 in my bank account and, um, a paid off house. Cause I was throwing everything either into this goal of paying off her house, my personal, you know, kind of paycheck or just everything back into the business. Right now we skipped a bunch of levels. And so part of this, part of the things that, that she struggles with, and I, I don't struggle as much because the entrepreneur like vision, what's the big thing we're going to go after is, is like dreaming. So we sat down for 45 minutes. I gave her two prompts. And one of the prompts was essentially like, what do you want our life to look like on these like four or five axes? And the other prompt was, you know, when you die, what do you want to make sure has happened? Not what do you want to be remembered for? Cause no one's going to remember you. It's just how it works. But like, what do you want to have happen? What's like a great life? And then just write. And I told her just to write whatever she thinks, whatever comes to mind. Right. And I think most of us would benefit from going through that activity because there's a lot of us who would not choose trying to go to a path to a 200 plus million dollar exit. And that doesn't make you better or worse. It's just, you wouldn't go down that path because it's not, it's not necessarily a fun path to a lot of people. The fun path is being a great father, being a great mother, being a great, whatever, um, trying to be an Olympic swimmer, whatever it is, like that's the path that you want. And so that dreaming exercise, I think is super, super crucial. What were those four or five different axes? So there were some very kind of, um, you know, the world of atoms axes, meaning like lifestyle, items, goods, material, like, you know, and there was a bunch of like, uh, you know, parentheses, like EG cars, blah, 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 like whatever it is. And then a number of those things were, you know, what problems do you want to solve? What do you want to attack? What does the life look like? What do you, you know, what emotionally do you want to evoke? What are the, the things that you want to make sure are completed your bucket list items on, under whatever those are? Um, but those axes are like, you know, physical lifestyle, 
Um, and then you're kind of going up Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? But you're on a very different axis because you can presumably have almost anything, right? You know, so like lifestyle, like, do we want to fly private? That's an interesting question, right? Like, and it doesn't matter the baggage, you know, that comes with that. It's just like, do you want to do it? Well, we could do that. We can't necessarily fly private and buy a yacht and do all these other things, but do we, are we those people? Um, we're not car people. I don't have a Lambo. I have like a 2013 Jeep Wrangler. Like that's what I drive in Puerto Rico. Like that's, but I also literally, when we were buying the car, we, we were looking at that, we were looking at a brand new Bronco, which is not really that expensive of a car. You know, it was pretty pricey. And I was like, Jenny, do you want me to get mad every time you slam the door or not? And she was like, no. And I was like, cool, let's get the Wrangler then. Cause I'm not going to care. You kick the crap out of this. I'm not going to care. Right. Cause it's not a brand new car. You can take, you know, take the boy out of the Midwest. You can't take the Midwest out of the boy here. But those were, those were basically the things on the list. How did your perception of having all this money versus what it was actually like different? Uh, I think you heard it in the first part. It like, it doesn't change it, it all. You're still a human. <laughs> you still have emotional problems. You still have, you still have purpose problems, right? I literally, I, I kept working, right? I kept working just as much, if not more afterwards. I'm still working, right? And it's not a, it's not a, huh, maybe I should be retired and on a vacation. It's not even a question, right? It only comes up in kind of this exploration that we did. But I think people listening to this, if you know what you want, the money is simply a, a fulcrum to getting what you want. It provides you leverage to whatever that is. If you want to just be a great dad that is always there for your kids' baseball games, you don't need that much money, right? If if you want to be a great dad and you want to maximize your time, you probably need to like retire early money or fire money or whatever it is. But that's one of those things that doesn't require a lot of money. If you're someone who wants to, you know, do heavy freedom inducing events or heavy freedom inducing activities, you need a lot of money. Like I get really, really excited by the idea of, hey, if this skyscraper is really exciting to buy because we want to tear it down and create a dog park or we want to buy and we want to turn it into low income housing or whatever it is the ability to do that excites the hell out of me i get so driven i don't want to do either of those things the idea that i can do it makes me really excited and i don't think i'm ever going to ladder down from that meaning the the time i can you know buy a new york city skyscraper at that point all of a sudden it's going to be like you know It'd be really, really cool to overthrow a dictatorship. And I'm going to need more money to do that. That really excites me, right? Like that, that ladder, right? And so that, that's one of the emotional type things when you're going through this exercise of like, what excites you, right? And it does, there's no right answer. There's just your answers. And then when you looked at when Jenny did it, when I did it, um, mine was very like bullets and all this other stuff. Hers was like over here, then it was over here, then it was over here, then it was over here. And then we worked together to organize each other's. And then we switched lists and basically we asked each other questions to clarify, no judging questions, just literally clarify. And then when we were done with that, we each went through each other's lists and basically said, we either support this, want to do it ourselves, don't care or are against it. And there were very few against it. Uh, and so all of a sudden, and then we talk through and then we start creating this combined vision for our life. And you can do this with or without a partner, just create a vision for your life of what that looks like and kind of go from there. What gave you the idea to do this exercise? I, I'm a big believer. I call it high output marriage. There's a famous book called High Output Management. You read it once a year? Uh, yeah, I used to read it four times a year. It's one of the best books on management by a guy named Andy Grove, the OG. And um, I don't know, we learn all this stuff in business about how to communicate properly, how to set expectations, how to do all these different things. And then when it comes to our personal lives, we just forget it. We accept really crappy friends and never tell them why they're crappy and then just stop hanging out with them when, you know, a real friend goes, hey, man, when you do this, it makes me feel this way and that's not great. Like, so can you stop doing that? And 99% of the time the person goes, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't even realize it, right? Same thing with your marriage. Same thing with your relationships. We have weekly one-on-ones and they're not like, there's no power dynamic, like we're a partnership or relationship, but there shouldn't really feel like a power, di- there is a power dynamic in you know, work, but like shouldn't feel that way right but we do that so that we have those conversations and what we found is like it helps with all these little things that kind of come up when it comes to like a marriage where she asks me when i'm about to go to bed if i can do something two days from now and i'm gonna forget it and not not take care of it but she throws on the one-on-one and all of a sudden resentment's down so kind of came up with this we did a marriage offsite um 
Reddit made fun of it because I posted about it, which is great. Um, that went viral. The only thing I was aggravated by is they didn't send the traffic to the actual LinkedIn post. They sent it to this like Reddit screenshot. But it's just one of those things where we do we do stuff. We do two retreats a year. Um, they're off sites we call them, but it's like it's a vacation with like dreaming and talking and having these conversations. Um, and there's a number of other things that we do that are just ported over from business um, because they're just really good frameworks to have conversation. One of the things you mentioned in a previous podcast was how you haven't spoke to your family in five years. Yeah. Why is that? And how have you lived in the world while having this broken apart relationship? And how has making all the money that you've made impacted that? Mm. We forget how much agency we actually have in our lives. When it comes to relationships, you get to choose your friends. Most of us don't really realize that till our late 20s. Uh, oh, the person I've just known forever who I hate hanging out with and has a lot of drama and brings me down, I don't have to hang out with them, right? And that agency goes to your family. That agency goes to what you're doing. Again, if you're listening to the Danny Miranda podcast, you probably have ultimate agency. The thing that you're struggling with is your choice. One, it's your choice to struggle with it. And two, it's your choice to figure out how to get over it and be patient to, to, to get that to some sort of resolution. And so with my family, I, again, not great childhood, but also not freaking terrible, right? And so, but a lot of baggage there and always struggle with it. Um, and when struggling with it, just in general, like the emotions of it, right? Because there's this societal stance that's like, well, it's your family. Of course, you need to be with your family, take care of your family, do all these things. If you don't go home for Thanksgiving or Christmas, you're a jerk, all of these other things, that's what society says. And I struggled with that for a long time. And then there was this like seminal moment, brought Jenny home for the first time. And Jenny was like the one. It was pretty obvious within a number of months, Jenny was the one. We've been together just under 10 years now. And it was one of those things where there was, there was a particularly bad memory from childhood that was kind of being brought up in a very jokey way. And that's okay, right? I was emotionally secure enough to handle that a number of years ago and just be like, eh, whatever, right? Well, the facts of that particular circumstance were being misconstrued. And I was the only one who would understand the facts of that circumstance. And I said, that's not what happened. This is what happened. I'm the only one who could really know that. Well, I was basically being gaslit. Again, not necessarily in a mal malintentioned way. I think my mom, it was, it was probably really hard for her to understand that a lot of this was happening, you know, because she was traveling a lot for work. And so it wasn't necessarily great when she was gone. So I think she was maybe just masking it with, oh, it wasn't that bad. This was like this, right? My brother, my brother and I have never really, you know, we've, we've seen eye to eye. I respect him. I love him. But it's also like one of those things that I didn't, um, like we don't have a, like a relationship. And then my dad, you know, talked enough about basically. But all of a sudden I'm sitting there feeling like I'm gaslit. And this is at a particular time when ProfitWell is starting to feel like we're, we're, in, we're, in, we're in crap. We're like trying to like really figure some stuff out and really trying to scale. And so we're sitting there and it's like this woman that I love that, you know, I want to be with. I'm worried about all the energy going on around this. It's really aggravating me. I, I don't have time to deal with this. And like, I'm not getting anything from this. And that doesn't mean I don't love them. It doesn't mean if they need, didn't need help, I wouldn't help them. But why am I out of obligation coming here and dealing with this and like bringing my energy that I need? And some people would say that's selfish. But again, I have my own agency, right? So if this is not helping me and it's not helping them, it's not like I'm bringing them anything either. It's not like me being absent all of a sudden is going to take something away from them. Like I have a choice. So that's when I chose to basically be like, nope, I'm done. I just stopped picking up the phone, stopped showing up. And um, yeah, it, it was interesting. And I ended up inviting everyone actually to last Thanksgiving. So they did come. It was the first time that I had um, really seen them and talked to them. They stayed with me. So that was interesting. And I did that again for a pretty selfish reason. I wanted to see if there was any societal baggage still there or how this just would affect me, right? And when they left, 
I enjoyed the time. There was not any like big blow up or anything crazy like that. But when they left, like I, I, I felt a very neutral feeling. And I basically was like, if they're in my life or not in my life, I feel no like negative or no positive. Right. And some people hear that and they go like, oh, you're, you know, you're done with your family. And I was like, no, I think the door's open now. When my dad calls, I pick it up. We talk. He, you know, pisses and moans about, you know, labor unions not getting what they need and all this other stuff and the economy and all this other, like just, you know, random dad talk. Um, if they come and they see me, great. If I'm in Wisconsin, I might go see them. But it's like not a, it's not like a thing where I'm pulled there. And I think that for most people, when you think through the agency, yes, these people are blood and that should mean something, but it's not necessarily something where your life, being in their life, should be the expense of what you're trying to do with whatever your mission is. And I think we, we miss out on that a lot because of a lot of like childhood obligations. Yeah, it, it's a really interesting thing to ask yourself how much do you, are you obligated towards the people who raised you yeah. in some sense? And it's different for each person. Yes. And it's different for each scenario. Yeah. And it's different for each age. You go with like you're 21 Seasons. years old versus 28 totally. versus 35 versus 45. Totally. And, you know, I'm curious like what advice you would have for maybe like a 21 year old listening to this. Sure. Who let's say is in the same exact position that you were in, would would it have benefited you at 21 to cut ties completely in some respect? Or are you grateful for that time that you've spent? How do you look at that today? Yeah. I don't regret the time because, but but it's not from a place of like, fond memories and I mean there are fond memories it's not like there's no fond memories but it's from a place of of more just peace if that makes sense I think if you're 21 years old and you're listening to this or thereabouts and you're listening to this your job is to figure your stuff out that's your job again we're starting from the premise that if you're listening to Danny Marina podcast found on iTunes Spotify etc um you need to make sure that like your, 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 your lowest parts of Maslow's hierarchy of needs are probably taken care of. Maybe not to the extent you want them to be, but they're taken care of, right? Your job, at least in my opinion, is to do everything in your power to align what your goal is to ultimately what you're actually doing. And most of us don't even do that. And so in that particular context, I would take it even a step further that if you've been given the opportunity to have your Maslow's hierarchy of needs taken care of, I think if I were to not make the most out of these 70 odd years, hopefully I get to have, I would feel like an asshole. I think if I was just sitting there not doing something to live up to the gifts I've been given, the background I've had, and I was just like screwing around living for the weekend, living for going to the bar every single night, I would feel like an asshole. I don't, that's, that's, that's for anyone else to, to figure it out. But to me, it feels like I am looking at and saying, Hey guy who drew a different straw and is now digging ditches and is literally praying for overtime. So he can like send his kid to a summer camp or something like that. I'm a huge jerk. If I know that that guy exists and I don't try to live up to some sort of potential. And that potential, again, it doesn't have to be building a company. It doesn't have to be like doing whatever. It might be being the best dad you can be, whatever it is. Like, I think that that's what you should be doing at 21 years old is figuring that out and then going, doing everything in your power to go after it. So in the context of family, if that's holding you back from that, like put it on ice. I think you, should, you probably should have handled it a little bit differently than I did. I probably should have told them what was going on. I just ghosted. That was probably the, not the adult way to do it. I should have said, listen, this is what's going on in my life. This is not helping me. I don't want to talk six hours about it. This is what's going on. And unless there's like a very clear misunderstanding, which there isn't, like th this is done for a while, if not forever. Probably should have done that. But I think if you're 21, you get that energy out and just like focus on what you're trying to do. Yeah. I want to go back to the aligning your what you actually want and your day-to-day -day actions because I feel like that a lot of that doesn't happen because no one 
stops us and says, hey, if you do this action every day for the next three years, will you be in a place you want to be? So what could you give by way of advice to help people align their North Star vision and their day-to-day actions? Well, first, you got to do a lot of thinking. And that's hard. Like, we don't, we don't sit down and go, what do I want to be when I grow up? We have some baloney answer, but we don't, we don't like focus on it. And then it's not even three years, man. Like, it's like, cool, this is what I want to do. Like, most stuff takes dozens of hours to get somewhat proficient at it. So you want to be in sales? Go to 200 sales calls. Go to 1,000 sales calls. You can do that within a quarter. Like, it doesn't take three years, but go after it. Because then you're testing, right? I intellectually want this, but do I actually want it? Like, when, when I'm in the crap, when I'm, like, being faced with adversity do I have enough, like, whatever to kind of push things forward? So that's the first thing is, like, understand what you want, go explore it a bit. And then as you, like, double down, you'll start doubling down and explore in serial. Don't explore in parallel. This is a mistake a lot of people make. They go, I could go do five things. Let me go explore all five. What you're doing is you're hedging constantly. You're like, well, I explore this, I really like this, but what about number four? Number four might be really interesting. So all of a sudden you're not looking at data whether that's collect or actual data on what the heck's going on with the first option or whatever it is, because you might want to go explore number four. What I would do is I would be like, these are my five paths, or here's what's important to me. Five paths might be more career orientated than anything. I'm going to start, I'm going to prioritize them. And if number one works out, it meets all of these criteria, meaning I want to be able to do this. I want this. I want to, you know, my end of my life to look like this. I want my lifestyle to look like this, et cetera. If that works, go with that. That's your life. Don't worry about number two, three, four, or five. If it doesn't, move on to number two as soon as possible. But that's the biggest thing. The second thing for 21, we don't do enough exploration, but we also don't do enough introspection of how we tick and what motivates us. This is the thing that most of us miss out on because you just guess and check your way to figuring this out. You're going to face challenge. Small challenge, medium challenge, large challenge, long challenge, short challenge, all types of challenge. But when willpower meets challenge, you only have three options. You have discipline, and this really comes down to routine. You are a personal trainer. You work out, I'm sure, regularly. You just do it because you are. And once you reach that particular point, you're not really sure why you do it anymore. You just do it. It's just part of your life. That's your routine. I think discipline, we have this weird conception of, well, discipline must mean I just like overcome so much not wanting to do it. Discipline is more routine than anything. The second thing we have is grit. Grit is basically whatever energy, some of us is really positively motivated, some of us really negatively motivated, I'm one of the negative ones. Whatever energy, you're just putting that fuel in the furnace to get through whatever it is. And understanding where that comes from is really, really important because you're gonna have to use it in certain situations. And then the third most important thing is what is your competing interest? And a competing interest is basically When I'm faced with this particular adversity, when I don't want to do this thing, what is the thing in the back of my mind of why I'm going to go do this? And a lot of us don't explore that enough because we're going to have a certain amount of willpower that we were just naturally born with for whatever we're trying to do. We slept well that day, whatever it is. When that meets challenge, you only have discipline, which you probably didn't develop that much as a kid. Grit, which you probably haven't done enough introspection to really use that fuel or you ultimately have that competing interest. And if you haven't done the exploration work, you don't know that you're calling that thousandth person that you don't really want to call that day because, oh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to be the CEO of this company and I need to do it through sales. You want that constantly going on in the back of your mind. And if you understand where that fuel can come from for one of those three things, if not all three of those things, You're unstoppable in whatever you're doing. And when you're in your 20s, you should be exploring the heck out of all of these things, not doing things out of obligation, not going home just because you're supposed to, making sure you're putting in those hours because what do you have? You have your intellect and effort. You don't have anything. You don't have experience. You have to develop that. And while you're developing that, getting introspective will make you unstoppable as you move forward. So you said that you use uh, negative fuel. Yes. A lot. And yes, that's beneficial for you. I personally... I can't remember the last time I was fueled by some negative thing. Sure. And not to say one's better or worse. I want to know, like, how do I tap more into the negative fuel? I don't think you want to. (laughs) No, seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Negative fuel is insecurity. 
insecurity is there's a lot <laughs> insecurity is very poor fuel it's it's like the crude oil of fuel meaning it hasn't been refined yet it hasn't been taken care of yet it's not the jet fuel that they skim off the top and some of us unfortunately have a lot from our childhoods from being bullied from being fat from being all of these different things it's a really poor fuel but if that's all you have you should use it and what i mean by negative fuel is i use those insecurities of all those different things that i said and i basically whenever there was someone who said no whenever there was a blog post that didn't go well is whenever someone said something like super negative on social media I looked at that and I gathered all that fuel and I said, great, this is going to be the thing that fuels my furnace so that I can do the next blog post, so that I can do the next sales call, so I can do the next product release and all of those other things. It's not the worst, or it is the worst, but it's not terrible. But the problem is, is what I should have done is instead of looking at that as strength, I should have said, how do I get over these insecurities? Because I'm going to be that much better when I get to the other side of them. When I accept who I am, when I accept that this is, I have chosen to not care about my health, therefore I am fat. And that does not mean me bad, does not make me good, makes me unhealthy, which is not good. But when I accept those things, all of a sudden they can't be used against me. And I'm not on this like self-propelling treadmill of more negative fuel, creating this like really gritty way of growing. I need more discipline. I need more of a competing interest because all it is right now is this crude oil of fuel that I have. And I think in society, we have all this anxiety going on. Anxiety is an opportunity and most of us don't take it. And I'm not talking about clinical, like actual real diagnosed anxiety. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about all this stuff where I complain to you about something that's going on and you're a bad friend and you go, yeah, that sucks. Let's wallow in it. Let's talk about it. Let me give you some affirmation about why it does suck and why it's okay for you to sit here and complain about it rather than fixing it, right? And that's, that's, a, that's a microcosm of most conversations that we're having. And it's like, well, the good friend goes, well, what are you going to do about it? How can I help you, right? Facundo, my business partner, I've struggled with my weight because what I ended up doing is I didn't have a strong competing interest. Like living longer, I don't care. Like I didn't care. I was like, no, the competing interest is building this company. So every single time it was a choice of going home and creating a clean, healthy meal versus ordering DoorDash so that I could write that next blog post, I chose DoorDash. It wasn't there. And so it was one of those things where Facundo was the best friend ever. He never said it was okay. And he's like a CrossFitter with 2% body fat. So he's, he's definitely a different animal. But he, was never, he never said it was okay. He was just like, hey, how can I help you? How can I help you figure this out, Right. And that was a good friend. And I never listened to him. Same thing with Noah Kagan. Noah Kagan always asked me about my weight. And I was always like hiding from him because my competing interest was always going after, you know, taking care of things. But what I should have done is I should have just accepted that insecurity and not used it for fuel. Or I should have like changed it, which I'm finally in the process now, not because I want to live longer, but literally because some of the things I want to do in life are going to require me to not be so fat, right? And so to kind of bring a point to this from the ramble, is insecurity is something to be overcome and we should use that insecurity and grasp it and there's a couple of things i do the first thing i do is i just get the insecurities out there because i don't want them as fuel and if you know my insecurities what else are you going to hold against me what are you going to do so i haven't done this yet but i've done it in drips but i'm just doing a tweet thread where i'm just like hey here's my insecurities i'm fat I've been on, I have a genetic thing that makes me on TRT. I've been on TRT since I was eight years old uh, because of this genetic thing. That means I'm also on fertility treatment. So I need fertility treatment to be able to reproduce. Um, somehow I, you know, I love to hunt, which makes me a raving, like lunatic conservative person in the world of tech, at least in my particular world. Um, I'm from the Midwest. And the Midwest, when you're in the world of tech, means you're dumb. That's what people typically think. Um, I had insecurity about being in Boston, you know, and being my entire class when I was at Google all went to Ivy League schools. I didn't go to those schools. There's a bunch of other insecurities, but I get them out there because now it's like, you don't have power over me. 
And I'm not going to let you have that power. And it's not that you wanted that power, but I'm not going to use that for fuel. I'm going to go back to discipline and that competing interest as much as possible. And then hopefully some positive grit, um, some positive fuel. There, there is an incredible amount of peace that you exude when you say all that. And I feel. Mm. And one thing that I notice as well is how many of those insecurities are rooted in assumptions for other people. Mm. Okay, so if I didn't go to an Ivy League school, that is bad. But the assumption could also be like, I didn't go and do an Ivy League school, so I have something different to show people. Or I'm from the Midwest, and therefore I'm not smart because people view me that way. But in that is the assumption that people are going to view you that way. It's so fascinating how when we say them or write them down, how many of those assumptions fall through the wayside because I'm shaking my head at some of the assumptions that you made in there, but you can only see those if you say them. And so I have a remarkable amount of respect for you to, on this platform, talk about all of your insecurities and show what you feel in your heart of hearts, who you truly are. Mm. What advice would you have for somebody to get to that place themselves of facing and saying some of the insecurities that have hold, held them back in the past? Don't let anyone be harder on you than yourself. That's it. If you say it out loud to your friends, to whomever it is, to the world, no one can be harder on you. Because what else do they have? Because in your head, you're like, what if they find out that I feel this way about my weight? What if I find out that like, I need medical help to conceive. What if they find out these things? Well, most don't care. No one gives a shit about you. Like, most, most people do not care. And so you're mentally tricking yourself to basically hurt yourself. And you're letting them, this, the, not even them, just the existence of them, make it worse. So when it's out there, if someone wants to come and say something to me or says they oh they want to make fun of me behind my back it's like yeah but i had the agency to get it out there what power do you have over me no one's going to kill me no one's going to cancel me no one's going to do these things like you think that that's going to affect me like i'm going to be harder on me than you ever will be and you don't care about me more than i care about myself therefore like what am i doing so tactically get it out there if you're insecure about it Find close friends. Start there. Hey, I want to talk to you about something. With guys, we're a little hard to do this because we don't normally talk about our feelings, but that's changing with Gen Z a little bit more, I think, for the better, which is good. It's having some not great consequences. But yeah, hey, I'm insecure about this. And then that friend should go, do you want help with this? And if you say no, great. Well, at least they know. And now they know, and now they can like help you with it. They can check in from time to time, be a really good friend. And then as you get up the ladder, like, Basically, if you have a public persona, like put it out there because all of a sudden that brings more and more positive fuel for you because you're sitting there and you're just like, okay, this is just who I am. And the more and more you accept who you are, the better off it is for you to get to wherever you're trying to go and do whatever you're trying to do. That's ultimately what you're trying to do is get to that, that level of peace. Some of us were nihilists and we just start from that premise. Like I... <laughs> It's hard for me to start from that premise because if I'm like, well, nothing matters and I'm just like, then why don't I kill myself, right? Like, it's just one of those things where it's just like, no, like something needs to matter and the matter is the game that you want to play and I want to play a particular game the rest of my life. Why am I going to give anyone else power besides myself in this particular situation and I want to control what I can control? It's a really true and interesting perspective. What about the health? How yeah. have you gotten your health in order? So... Tactically, it's not dramatic. Um, I have a coach. We talk every day, but Sunday, um, really, she's just accountability, take pictures of my food, all this other fun stuff. But but really, the deeper, the deeper part of this is the most important. And the deeper part was tricking my brain into how this is going to help me with the future. And one of it, one of those aspects was, well, in order for you to do X, Y, Z, you need to be healthy. You need more of a marathon brain. The next company I'm going to start is going to be a 30 to 50 year journey. And I want it to be 50 rather than 10, right? And so I need to go after it. 
Um, and that's that's something where like health is going to be really important. Notice how it's not, I want to live longer. I want to like play with my kids, whatever that is. That fuel or that competing interest and whatever it works, that's going to be something that you're going to have to figure out yourself. And then the other thing was the areas that I want to kind of play in, like health is going to be something that's really, really important. If I go start a healthcare company, I can't be a fat ass running a healthcare company. Like you can, it's America and you know, these types of things are interesting, but like I can't be, right? Um, or at least it's not going to send the right message. Now I don't need to be my business partner for Kundo who's, you know, 3% body fat or whatever, but like I need to be someone healthy and I need to understand. But for me, it was literally aligning health with essentially my future or my goals or what I'm actually going for. And I think that's the hack that most people need to do is if you find yourself not being able to do something, first ask, should you do it? Is it okay that you don't do it? I would say half the time it ends there. I don't need to do it. I don't want to do it. I shouldn't have to do it. I don't like to do it. Great. Don't do it. And then if it's like, well, no, I need to do this. I need to go after it. Then it's like, great. Well, how do you hack your brain to figure out how you can align it with whatever competing interests you have in order to be successful? That's what I did. And all of a sudden it's, it's been working. And then obviously, you know, having some help makes it a little bit easier, but I don't have a chef. I don't have these types of things. It's not like I'm, you know, being spoon fed or someone following me around, knocking food out of my hand. It's literally like developing those muscles. And then I would say the most important factor is just be patient. Like with a lot of these things, nothing happens overnight. And it's the middle where all of the work gets done. The beginning, you're hopped up, you go to the gym finally, or, you know, start writing or start tweeting or whatever the heck your goal is. The end, oh my God, we're so successful. I got a six pack. I sold a company for a couple hundred million dollars, et cetera. It's the middle you got to fall in love with. And if you can't fall in love with it, you got to be at least patient with it because it's going to take some time. Why did you say 50 years for the next thing as opposed to five years or 10? What, what about 50 yeah. is so appealing to you? I think the last one I start is the last one I'm going to start. And I want, I, I'm a mission guy. I can't, like, it's really interesting. There's some entrepreneurs, a lot of my entrepreneurial friends think I'm an idiot. Um, not from like an intelligence standpoint, but from a, why aren't you going towards the easiest path? Why are you going towards the, you know, go start another SaaS company, go start a course on pricing. That's something that, you know, I'm pretty known for. Go do these types of things. And for me, none of that is appealing. Part of that's the wiring we talked about where I'm sitting here and I'm like, well, I need something more and more challenging because I'm constantly testing my limits. And therefore, you know, this wasn't hard. Therefore, I need to go find something that's hard, right? But the other part of it is, you know, I look at the Sisyphus story and I go, Sisyphus was pretty happy. He rolled that stone up the hill came down. I imagine, I think Albert Camus said this last or first, you know, I imagine Sisyphus smiling when he died because he had a mission. His mission was to roll that stone up the hill, let it go down the hill. And his mission was to go do it again. I love that. I like walls that I can go through and all and easy walls aren't appealing to me. So a 50 year company isn't like a corner store. A 50 year company is choosing a problem. that's going to take 30 to 50 years to solve. Hopefully not completely solve it in 30, 50 years, meaning like we're going to solve some of it in five, some of it in 15, et cetera. But that's, that's what's most appealing to me. And again, it goes back to what I said, which no judgment if this isn't for you, but like, I feel like a jerk if I don't live up to some sort of potential that I've been born with, given, developed, whatever background you, you know, come from, you'll, you'll pick one of those, right? God, flying spaghetti monster effort, whatever it is. But I just feel like an asshole if I don't, you know, live up to that potential versus the guy who wasn't given that opportunity or the family that's struggling, you know, not even the U.S., but struggling in sub-Saharan Africa. Like, you know, you're put on this earth for a certain number of years, like go after it. And I don't even care. I honestly don't even care if it comes from a hedonistic perspective where you just want as much money as humanly possible. Like at least go for something. Um, that's, that's my view at least. You've said before that the three biggest areas for improvement in maybe the U.S. or the world is defense, debt, and politics. Mm. So is it fair to say that one of your company, the future company that you build, is going to be in one of those three areas? I think I'd add healthcare as well. Mm. So that was in July of 2022 that yeah. you said that. I think that, um, I think death and healthcare are like probably related. But I think going after large problems is a virtue when it comes to building something. 
It's not for everybody. I don't think you should do it for the first thing you ever do. But it gets me really amped and really excited. Now, for you, it might be, again, I, I don't need, necessarily need to qualify anymore, but going after a big problem. Like, we have a couple friends, Dylan and Henry. They want to be the best storytellers in the world. That jacks me up. I'm excited by it. It's a very, like, Jiro Dreams of Sushi type style where it's like they're going to be incrementally better every video they do, every piece of content they do, and they're just on that journey until they're done with it, until it's not fun anymore, which might not be ever, right? Because that's like a big old problem. Going and solving the healthcare problem in this country, the big problem, right? It's not quite a Jiro Dreams of Sushi problem. It's not quite iterate, 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 but it is one of those things that if you can like figure out how to solve it and figure out how to, you know, make health span longer, basically take Andrew Huberman, and Peter Atia, and your doctor's office and just like, shove them all into one that's exciting right defense not a lot of people talk about but defense is one of those worlds where like there's no secret bunker that has some magic weapon that's going to save us whether it's intelligence or actual you know atoms you know in terms of going after you know physical conflict and the world's going to become more regionalized over the next 20 years um next 50 years definitely in a regionalized world where you don't have you know some hegemonic power like the united states um, and, you know, <laughs> very left-leaning people are going to get their wish. All of a sudden, the world's police isn't going to necessarily have as much power as it once did, and it's been on a slow decline for a while from a defense department. It doesn't mean the U.S. is screwed or anything like that. I'm not saying that, but it's like a regional world is going to require more intelligence. Um, and now we're talking about intelligence, talking about the intelligence community, um, cybersecurity, all these other things than it did 30, 40 years ago. And so that's a really, really fascinating place. And then in terms of debt, that's growing exponentially. I don't really know how we put the genie back in the bottle. Do we just agree to have inflation all the time? Do we just agree to, you know, money doesn't matter anymore? Is it a crypto solution? I don't know, but there is a very, very large population or there's a very large portion of the global population that has uh, relied on the economy of the world growing very, very quickly. And all of a sudden, when you throw a world of debt in that threatens that world economy, that gets a little scary. Again, in the U.S., you'll be fine. But, like, the rest of the world, not going to be fine. And then I think in politics, I think this whole, like, getting money on a politics thing that we've tried to do with, you know, politicians basically asking barbers if they need haircuts. Like, you know, hey, like, should we, should we try and, you know, get less money in politics? Oh, of course, but they won't vote for it or anything like that. I think that there is, there's, there's actually not an amazing company for this, meaning like it's not going to be a multi-billion dollar company, but I think you could get a $200 million revenue company that completely upends how money and politics interface by lowering the bar to entry, basically equalizing the playing field for someone to run for office by making money so efficient that having more money in the system doesn't necessarily mean you're going to win which means you, you, you presumably fix the problem that we have with money in politics. Um, and that genie's not going back in the bottle either. I'm fascinated by your perspectives on all of these, but I'm also really interested in how you got to the conclusion that these are the three or four biggest issues that are worth facing. Sure. What was your thought process in terms of how you came to those conclusions of these are the problems we're facing? We start from the premise that we want a life of the rest of my life. I want to do one thing, right? I want to go after one problem. So that's a premise, premise number one. Premise number two is we want to make the biggest impact. And th the subtext you're hearing here is not the biggest impact from, I want to necessarily make the most money or I want to necessarily like, like it is ultimately to help the world be a quote unquote better place. But there's a lot of unintended consequences with fixing some of these things. So really it comes down to like the generic word of disruption. So that's really what this is. It's like, how do we disrupt a level of status quo here or the biggest impact? And hopefully it's a positive impact. Like I'm not going to steer it towards a negative impact, but what happens when you make money in politics really efficient? Well, you might just get a lot more money, which is probably going to happen. But if your efficiency is not necessarily symmetrical, you've just helped the people with all the money just entrench themselves, right? And then, so those are, those are some premises. Then you got to go from first principles, right? 
what are the things that are going to do that? Well, one way to approach this is you're going to go after really big spaces, right? And the other premise really is, is like, this isn't a craft. Like, I'm not trying to be Dylan or Henry where I'm trying to like, you know, be the best at, you know, this particular thing. I want to be the best at disrupting a giant industry is basically the idea, right? So all those premises aside, the first principles are, well, what are the biggest markets? Or what are the markets that affect people the most? Money? Government? Health? All of them really fall into those three categories. Defense is basically in the the, the government aspect, right? And so, and I guess that's security. That could be the fourth, right? It just so happens every single one of those industries, with the exception of the politics one, are some of the largest industries we have. And I also think that, like, there's a couple other things, like energy. There's a number of other industries that are worthy of that, but those are all industries that, like, so many people are already after. And it's just not as appealing to me if, like, there's 17 different companies going after it. Um, yeah, but that's more of a personal thing. You've said before that on a long enough time horizon, everyone wants to be Mr. Beast. <laughs> that's a left turn. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it is loosely related to yeah. the point of money and how even if you have a lot of money, it seems like people want fame. Yeah. What would you rather? $1 billion or 1 billion viewers of whatever it is you are putting out content-wise? This is a billion viewers. Like, it, it's not the right answer. That answer is right for me. Um, because, and it's it's really easy for me to say that too, because I don't have a billion dollars, but I have quite a bit. And it's like, my life has not changed. I still sit in my room most of the day and work and do things right on the internet. Um, and so I think it's one of those things where, you know, viewers, I think is, is, is more powerful. Right. And this is, this is something, frankly, I've struggled with the past number of months where, you know, I, I'm still, you know, seeing paddle through and, and, you know, doing a lot there, but I, I, I've kind of started and stopped with like content because again, going back to competing interests, uh, we, for those who don't know, ProfitWell, we were one of the first B2B business companies to do content, like hardcore content. Not like here's a blog post and an ebook, but like we had eight different podcasts and video series. I hosted a, a show called Pricing Page Teardown, where I would collect data and tear down pricing pages and had 60,000 people viewing that per episode, which is kind of crazy to think about because it's very niche. Um, but we did a lot of that. And it was really easy for me to produce content when it was in the context of, again, the the mission, which is, you know, building the company. And then all of a sudden, um, I'm no longer, you know, producing the content because, you know, Pal's got a really big marketing team that's great and all that kind of fun stuff. But now it's become, well, do I do more personal brand things? And I was talking to a friend of mine and we were, we were talking about something else. Then all of a sudden I was like, made a comment about content. And he's like, I don't know if you really, like, do you really want to do this? I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, I'm putting out 300 pieces of content per week. And I was sitting there and I was like, yeah, I know. And he's like, yeah, but whenever we talk, we always talk about all these other things. We don't talk about content at all. So like, do you really want to do it? And it, it like put me on my back feet because I was thinking about it. And I wasn't putting in the context of my goals because I was like, well, if I start a healthcare company, like I'm not going to be the face necessarily of a healthcare company. Right. So like, should I be doing content? Right. And it kind of came down to like, no, like having an audience of some sort, um, whatever audience you choose that you develop is really, really powerful, regardless of what you're going to do in the future. And I think audience is one of those things that the second half millennials, Gen Z, totally get. Gen X, baby boomers, they just don't understand it because they've always looked to these authoritative figures that were kind of handpicked as, well, that's the authority, right? Well, now we don't, we don't look at, you know, someone on Fox News or someone on CNN as having the authority. We look at, well, let's see what Danny Miranda thinks, right? We look at what is Mr. Beast saying? not in his mass market videos, but in his like interviews, right? Like how does he think about the world, right? And I think that's really, really powerful. So all of a sudden now competing interests and now now I'm kind of going after it. But yeah, I think audience is, audience is everything if you're really trying to disrupt something. So then why have you stopped and started your content journey? I stopped and started because like I said, I didn't have the competing interests. I didn't, I didn't hack my brain to get around that. I think the other thing, I was looking for permission. Like I was looking for... Um, from Facundo in particular, because I, cause he's someone who just, he's technically Gen X and he just doesn't understand. He's just like, I don't understand the content. 
because he'll look at some of the things that I send him and he's just like, this is so trite. And he's a guy who like wants to read a really long article, which is, you know, an audience, right? So he just doesn't understand some of the game. And, you know, he, I, I don't think, I think he respects it or I don't think he respects it actually in a lot of senses. So I talked to him, I actually called him up like after, after having this conversation with Alex and I was just like, Hey man, do you, are you okay if this is like a certain amount of my time per week, even if it has nothing to do with like the business? He's like, we talked about it for like an hour because he was like, well, why are we doing this? Are we doing it for external validation? Are we doing it for happiness? Are we doing it for this? Are we doing this? All that kind of stuff. Good friend. That's what a good friend does. And at the end of it, he was like, yeah, I'm fine with this. Yeah. As long as it doesn't distract. And obviously this is the number one priority at all times, that kind of thing. I think this helps our goals, you know, if we're going to go do this. And I was like, cool. And I think the other permission was just from myself of like, it's effort. Like it's effort. Like I have a good following, but I don't have like a crazy following, right? In order to develop a crazy following, you have to put a lot of effort in. And I think that just giving myself permission to be like, nope, we're in a season of like hardcore work. Like we're going into this season and this is just what it is. If you wanted to take time off, you'll take it later. And I think that was the permission I needed to kind of give myself with that jolt from having conversation with Alex. So what does, and you're talking about Alex Formosi? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I try not to name drop uh, him because <laughs> everyone loves Alex, but really I'm the much smarter bearded fellow. <laughs> That's really what you should say. Well, he's one of the most recent guests of this podcast, oh, so awesome. I just wanted to. Very cool. Um, what, with the content specifically, what is the current strategy at your current level? And I like to timestamp this because with how wise you are, with how well-connected you are, with how much you've, you've done successfully, I think you are going to be one of the most followed voices in the world of business if you so choose and yeah. commit yourself to it because- Dude, I'm sitting here like, how in the world does everyone not know who you are? Mm. And that just speaks to how early it is on your journey. So sure. wh where are you currently with content and what is your current strategy? Because I think this will be fascinating to look back on sure. in a year or three or five. So great question. Here's what I struggled with. I struggled with, there's a certain style of content that is high volume and very broad within, let's say, some bounds, right? So I think that you have, you have a group, like, you have a group of people who, we know these people. They tweet 10 times a day. Let's say one of their tweets is insightful. And it's not that it's just insightful to me, it's just in general insightful. And then the rest of it is, don't forget to hydrate, eight glasses of water a day. Like, just this trite, bullshit right it's the equivalent of like i i'm convinced that those tweets are the equivalent of like the motivational signs that your mom buys at joanne fabric and puts up in your house that's literally what it is for millennials and gen z right live laugh love like like stuff like that and so what i really struggled with is it was really difficult for me to see how can i do volume without sounding like that and it works. That's why people do it. But for me, it was like one of these things I really struggled with. And I talked to like Nick Huber about it. I don't know if you know Nick Huber. It's coming on the podcast. Excellent. Very soon. Very like good. Awesome. You got, you, you always have great guests, but these are, these are a couple guys like Hermosi, Huber. It's a number of others. Like I, I think are really, really good for the next generation here. But I really struggled with that. And I was talking to him about it and he was just like, you're caring too much. Like you're caring too much. You have, and, and the limiting belief was, you have no idea, like, if that's trite or not. Like, it's not trite to their audience. Maybe it's, like, profound to their audience, right? And so, again, and it just, it's so dumb because, like, I've done audience development. I've done all these things in my business. But all of a sudden, I was like, okay, well, what audience do I want? So the audience that I want to go after is the best way I can describe it because I have a couple of ways coming after it that are very imprecise. I really just want Scott Galloway's audience. Not because I love Scott Galloway or anything. I don't have strong opinions, but Scott Galloway has this particular audience where it's a bunch of VPs and executives at all kinds of like influential companies, but he doesn't approach it. And I don't want to say pretentious because I actually respect some of the people who are more intense, but there's, there's other audiences that are, I don't know, like very, um, very, uh, like it's like scientific literature you're basically reading, right? So I don't want to go that far. I shouldn't have said that. Uh, I don't mean that that's pretentious, but I want like Scott Galloway's audience. Um, there's a certain group of people. They're typically higher net worth. If not, they're on the path to being higher net worth. 
you your audience is probably on the tail end of that because there's a lot of people who want to be high net worth in your particular audience, but like that's kind of the spectrum. It's a it's a heavily influenced audience. And so first it was defining that. The second part was how are you going to get up the mountain? And this is where my problem is. My problem is always I'm going to overthink and I'm going to over strategize what the heck's going on, right? So the first thing that I did is I started doing, do you want me to go through process too? Because I think this is actually helpful for some people. Um, so the first thing that I did is, and this is something I learned when I worked at NSA, is I started collect. And collect is basically, you have particular targets. Um, and a lot of people think that it's a math equation. Bad guy does this, let's go get them. In reality, a lot of collect is all about, I want to understand and I want to come up with a profile on you so that I can try to predict your particular actions. So if I was trying to do this on Danny Miranda, I would sign up for Danny Miranda's email list. I would sign up for alerts on his Twitter. I would sign up for obviously the podcast. I would sign up for all these things. And I'm going to put that into a Google filter in my Gmail. And then once a week, I'm going to go click on Danny Miranda and I'm going to look through everything that Danny Miranda's published. And I'm just going to start taking notes, almost like a journal. And then slowly that develops a profile. And then what I'm slowly going to start doing is I'm going to start to predict, okay, I think Danny, the next six months is going to do a couple of these things. He's going to take the podcast in this particular direction. He's going to start doing more of these guests than these guests. And I don't know, something else. And then I wait six months, I continue to develop the profile. And all of a sudden I see how right or wrong I am. And those particular kind of directions. Now I can start to internalize if I'm trying to replicate, be... Uh, compete with, et cetera, Danny Miranda. I did this with every single one of my competitors, not only the company, like what was coming from the company. I did this with their their main leadership, their co-founders. Um, I did this with acquisition targets. Just develop Collect. Because Collect is, is a journey of a long-term journey. It's not a short-term journey, but you want to do it over the long-term because as soon as you do something and I'm competing against you, I already want all that background knowledge. And I want to understand if you broke the frame of what I thought you were going to do, I want to go figure out why. And I want to go through my, my, my history, basically. So I started doing that with a couple of people. A couple of people I wanted to kind of replicate in terms of, um, you know, types of content or at least audience. And so started developing that. And then the first principle comes into, okay, what's the way up the mountain? What I started doing was, let's do these two podcasts and let's do this, like basically building the media company that I had already built at ProfitWell, essentially. And then I pulled that back and where we are now is basically, okay, the most powerful thing is the email list. And the email list doesn't necessarily need to be super active, but you want to start to create an email list because then I want to point those things at harder level things. So what I mean by that is started a convert kit, just started collecting email addresses. Literally every like little tweet, every whatever, hey, by the way, I got these email addresses. I got that up to a few thousand already. Just like passively doing that for un basically a month, right? Not really calling it out, not doing anything too crazy. Now what I'm going to start doing is I'm going to start building one fantastic, undeniable guide per month. I don't need money, so I don't need to sell it. So I'm going to create this whole collect thing, this whole competitive strategy I just gave, one of the first guides. Here's everything. Not only that, I'm going to have all the templates. I'm going to have all the different things in there. And basically going to have this guide, one per month. During that month, not sure quite yet, but before this and after this, meaning before the post and after the post, bunch of different things that are basically promoting the newsletter from that content because I've developed that content. I don't want to think about what Twitter thread I should do on that Tuesday. I just want to take sub chapter two, turn it into a thread and throw it out there, right? So all this promotion comes in, starts to build that list. Using that list, you're going to have to pay to get the template. And the pay is not cash. You're going to have to share or do something to get the template basically. So now all of a sudden I have this one thing working basically dividends. And this is not like a revolutionary concept. This is like content marketing 101 with a couple of different twists. And then on top of that, just literally committing to being out there. So it's not going to happen right away because I wanted to be sustainable. So in the next couple of weeks, all of a sudden you're going to start seeing a lot more just on my social channels. Like, And then as that particular builds, once I reach a particular um, subscriber threshold, and that's going to, the number is going to depend on a couple of experiments. That's when I launched the higher order thing, a particular podcast, and it's all going to start in business. So it's all going to be business, by the way. Then the business podcast comes, that's going to complete this loop even further. And there's a bunch of different sub loops I'm happy to get into if it's interesting. 
then eventually we're going to start to expand beyond business and we're going to get into like probably like health or things like that where it's like i can have a researcher read the 64 articles on eggs and give you a definitive answer should you be eating eggs or not instead of listening to six hours of andrew huberman talk about the lectin and all this other stuff that you're not going to understand i can give you like here's 800 words on why you should eat eggs and here's all the resources if you really want to dig into it right and then we'll expand into maybe then that's when we'll do a podcast like this where it's like super broad and the list will be growing over time so that's the current strategy if i've learned anything about strategies it'll be thrown out in nine months but like that's the initial foundation um but it starts with just being consistent and then that guide is going to be kind of the central point and then eventually we'll see where the data takes us. It will be so cool when somebody tweets this video back to you in 2026. I'm like, what an idiot. <laughs> yeah, or yeah. or he followed this perfectly and looked yeah, at the exact Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. Yeah, the best laid plans, right? Like I think I just think it's I I'm trying and then the most important part and this is what Huber challenged me on is like you can't be like you, you need to you need to automate or outsource or whatever in source as much as this humanly possible. Like you can't be the center. He's really, really good at like, I would just say straight up delegating in general. I'm very like in the weeds with a lot of this stuff. And so that's the most important thing is, you know, there's this writing partner I've had for a while, um, basically talking to him about, and we're going through a little pilot of him, like running it basically being like operationally. Cause it's not, it, it I'm still going to be involved in all the content. Cause I, I, I'm not going to be able to get out of that. I think ever, because a lot of it's the ideas and stuff like that, but there's all this stuff, you know, this, there's all this stuff around that, that requires hours and time. And so getting that to be as automated as humanly possible. And then most importantly, being as patient as hell, like it's not going to happen overnight and that's okay. Like, but it's a 10 year journey, right? It's a 20 year journey. It's a 30 year journey. Right. Um, and I think that's, that's been a, a really good filter that I've had for for making decisions now is like getting over that hump. And that's what I talked to Hermosi about. I was just like, well, I'm trying to approach it as like a multi-decade journey. And I think that's the thing that was like holding me back is like, am I willing to do this in 25 years? And I wanted to, but I needed some of that permission or I didn't need some of that permission, but I wanted to get some of that permission. Yeah. It, it's remarkable. And I, I'm really grateful you, you outlined that strategy like that. I'm curious to dive into the scoreboard notion document that yeah. you mentioned before. And you kind of mentioned his passing is like, yeah, this wasn't the thing, but I feel like it will still be helpful for people to understand sure. and to recreate on their own. Yeah. Particularly because if they get some of these wins, they can put them on the, the scoreboard notion. Yeah. yeah. So scoreboard is a framework I developed in that middle period where, uh, you know, getting that self-esteem and insecurity was, was driving a lot of things. And, it also developed because there's, this has been said a number of different ways, but there's no amount of affirmations that are going to make up for actual evidence that you are successful, struggling, or whatever, right? And I think that back to some of the anxiety comments, you know, that I made before, I think we have a, a culture right now that is increasingly, I think, on a long enough timeline, evolution's undefeated, but like we increasingly are focused on people being in purgatory with their success or failure. And what I mean by that is they're sitting there and you want to be successful at something and we're not pushing you towards that. We're not talking to you about it. We're saying it's okay for you to be in your mediocrity, right? And similarly, if you're wired to be a little bit more negative, we're sitting there and we're like, it's going to be okay. We're not pushing you to get over some of those insecurities. And so scoreboard was a framework that I developed as a manager and also just as an individual to help the people that reported to me, but also to help myself, depending on where I was feeling that particular month when I read it, um, kind of regulate around being more neutral when it came to my, my self-esteem or my emotions. And the basic idea is, we all have things we've done. We all have things we failed at. We've all had things that we want to do. And there's all these things that, you know, we, we might want to do, right? And so all this is, is a notion doc that has these different categories of things. So the first is, what are your wins? We all have wins. It doesn't matter if you sold a company, didn't sell a company. We all have these wins. Um, you might have won a soccer tournament. You might have, um, you know, gotten the best uh, economics major award or the minor award, or whatever it is. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter how big or small these are, but you have these wins that you've had. And what I recommend to people is try to find 
a certain level, right? So it's not a participation trophy. It's not like you cured cancer. If you've cured cancer, like put it on the scoreboard, but you have your wins. And so literally writing down those wins. I've done this. So for me, I won a national title in debate. Um, I sold a company for a couple hundred million dollars. I did a number of these different things. There's a number of other things that I've been able to do, which is great. Then there's losses. These are things that you are basically admitting defeat on. And there's some people, I'll, I'll kind of tell you how I do it, where it's like, these are things that I am like not going to fix. Or these are really, let me back up. Then you have losses. The losses are essentially, these are things that you have tried to fix or you tried to have be successful at and you still are not successful. These are things like, I've tried to lose weight. I've actually lost hundreds of pounds in my lifetime, Danny. I used to be this big and then I lost 100 pounds in college. Then over the company, I gained it all back. I've tried to maintain a healthy weight. I haven't been able to do it yet. That's one category. And just those two categories help you regulate. When I'm feeling down and I look at my scoreboard, all of a sudden I'm like, hey, look at these wins. Like, I'm pretty cool, right? When I'm feeling a little high on myself and I look at the scoreboard, I'm like, yeah, you're still a fat ass. Like, you know what I mean? You got to figure this out, right? And then there's some people call it reaches. Reaches are basically like, these are things that are you want to go after um, that you just haven't tried yet. I want to get become a pilot. I want to enter a bodybuilding competition. Like whatever it is. These are just kind of dreams or reaches. And then there's acceptances. And these are the things that you have tried, you failed at, and it is okay. It is absolutely okay you failed at and you're not going to try again because you've just accepted them. And some of these are personality traits, right? I am not great with people who are what I call feelers reporting to me. I'm just not great. It's part of, you know, the, the Asperger's, you know, I've had over, over, you know, my lifetime here. It's part of me being more of a data person. If someone, it's hard for them to have direct conversations or quick conversations or conversations where we're not caring beyond a reasonable amount about how everyone feels in the conversation, you shouldn't report to me. And I'm, I, I've tried to change it. I can't change it. I always fail. I'm just accepting it. It doesn't mean I'm worse or they're better or I'm, wor I'm better and they're worse. It just means we're not great to work directly with another. It doesn't mean we can't work on projects or can't you know be on the same team or anything. It's just we're not there, right? But it's these types of things that you know might be more ethereal or more like feelings, but also things like I'm trying to think of something more physical. I've accepted. I'm not going to be. I'm not going to be in the NBA anymore. Like it's just not going to happen. I've accepted that, right? And just putting that on the list. And then I look at this about once a month. Um, it's just a recurring calendar invite. And I just look at my scoreboard. I have found this helps with your personal life as well. Jenny hasn't done her scoreboard yet, but there's some things that Jenny's working through that like, I think the scoreboard framework is going to help a lot with. She's got a lot going on, so she hasn't gotten to it quite yet. It's actually something we've talked about recently. I've found people have helped their relationships with this a lot and also the direct reports because I've had direct reports who young hotshot kids and they're they're good they're really really good but they got to have a 10-year journey to get 10 years of experience to like really be great right and so the scoreboard helps them remind them of those losses those things that they're not going at. and then i've had you know unfortunately just given society um you know a lot of you know women who have reported to me who are just really down on themselves and just think that they're not doing that well and i'm like look at all these wins like look what everything's going on and it helps both sides of, of kind of the emotional roller coaster what have you noticed as some of the most common themes of the people who have been successful from 21 to 35. Like you've seen a lot of people go through that cohort. Yeah. And I'm curious what stands out in terms of common themes. Successful people have struggled with something that has a serious feedback loop. That's huge. And what I mean by that is right now, if you're 21, you should not start a company. Everything we've talked about might make you think that you should start a company. I don't think you should do it. And the reason is, is because you're not going to get a quick enough feedback cycle. Now, there's plenty of people who are 21 and started a company and are successful. I totally get it. But if we're trying to hedge our bets, you should join a company of a second or multi-time founder so they've been through it before. They've done all of the pain that you you haven't necessarily been through. And they're going to do it again because they're starting their new company. You should get on like the ground floor, maybe first 10 employees. If you're really, really business focused, that's what you should do. Find someone who's starting their second, their third, fourth, whatever company. Get on the ground floor, the first, let's just say 30 employees because I think you can still be there. 
and go after that particular person and try to be their chief of staff, try to be really, really close to them and basically say, I don't think you should say you should work for nothing. I think some people say that, but I think you should basically say like, I'm going to dedicate my next four years to doing whatever you need me to do. Because that's what you have, right? Unless you have a very specific skill set. Even if you were an engineer in school, you have four years of engineering experience, coding experience. I'm not going to hire you as a principal engineer, right? You're going to be an entry level engineer and you're going to be in the engineering team. And if you want to start a company, it's not the best place to be. The best place to be is to be near the locus of conversation and decision making, right? That's what you should be doing. And when you're going after that, commit to, I will do this, but here's what I want. I want to be in the room. I won't say anything. I, I'm happy to give opinions like in a one-on-one or anything, like that, but I want to be in the room and I want a one-on-one every two weeks where I can just ask at least every two weeks. They really should be every week, but if they're not a great manager, maybe they're not going to be in there every week. But I just want to be able to ask you questions and maybe like a lunch every month where I can just like ask you all the questions. That's what you should be doing. And the reason is, is because you're going after something extremely difficult, but you have a feedback cycle. You're seeing it. You're doing it. You're going to be given a lot of really hard stuff. We're going to have to sacrifice time, effort, all these other things. But you're also getting this like really, really tight feedback cycle. Let's say you don't want to start a company. Like that's not on your mind. Go try to be a national or international champion at a particular sport or activity. Not even kidding. One of the biggest things we didn't even talk about that contributed to my success was going to college on a debate scholarship. For four years, for 40 hours a week, I wrote, spoke, and came up with arguments and critiqued those arguments and got told I sucked every single week. Not just like blanketly, but like this wasn't as good, this could have been good, and just at the margins, because I was at a very competitive program, a program that's got more you know, national titles than any other program in the country. And not no funding. You'd think that that program would have a lot of funding. No, we were all peer, peer coached. So all of a sudden I had the seniors when I was a freshman, like making me go out onto the quad in the middle of the winter and go like give my talk and basically like, you know, throw snowballs at you. That's like the hazing. We don't do hazing anymore, I don't think. But like, you know, do stuff like that. And then then come back and teach me how to structure my introductions better. Teach me why you want to use this word and this adjective in this order rather than this order in order to make a sentence really, really pop. I did that for four years. And then I competed. And you competed in a sport. It's not a sport, sorry. An activity where all of a sudden it's it's speech and debate, which there are some rules, but it's not like, you know, gymnastics where it's like, well, if they do this, then this thing happens, right? It's it's literally subjective. And so when you go to a nationals, first got to qualify for nationals. Then you go to nationals with a few hundred people. And you have like, I, I, I sat with six events. So I have six different events that I'm doing. Then they take the hundreds of people who made it to nationals. They boil it down to 24. Then they boil that 24 down to 12. Then they boil that 12 down to six. And you've gone through all these different rounds and it's six people who are all good. They wouldn't be in the top six if they didn't. And then you're sitting there and little things like, well, everything was so great, but your tie was crooked. There's not an activity I've ever done that has been that competitive. Because you're sitting there and you're trying to battle everything. And then your tie being crooked is the thing that separates you from everyone else because they got to put something and that was mildly distracting. Therefore, it distracted from your argument. I mean, it's bullshit, but like that's the only thing that was left, right? So that was an activity. Go be a gymnast. Go try to be an Olympic athlete. Whatever it is, try to find something where you're going to be the best at because you're going to get that feedback cycle. Because every single tournament I went to, things got incrementally better. If you don't want to do that or you're not particularly athletic or you don't have that particular avenue, go try to join the military. Seriously. But join the military and go after a particularly difficult part of the military. That doesn't necessarily mean you got to be a SEAL or something like that, but it does mean if you go into an elite institution and try to be the elite, the Navy Seabees, it's a construction battalion. You can go be part of the elite part of that particular group, right? There's a lot of different parts of that particular you know, organization. But go try to do something that has great difficulty and a very tight feedback cycle. Every single person that I have met from their 20s to 30s that has done one of those three things has been astronomically successful. And it's one of those things that they are even if they choose just to be go be a great dad or a great mom the rest of their life, which is a wonderful, wonderful goal, they've been even better at those particular jobs than if they just went and worked for six years at Facebook or did something like that. I'm sure there's other jobs that those three things really, really stand out. Sounds like 
the combination of that advice is challenge yourself with something difficult and you will take the lessons you learn from doing that difficult thing and be a better human being. Yeah. Go do hard things. Hard things, it, it, it doesn't have to be this David Goggins masochistic type thing. And I shouldn't say it's masochistic because I don't know if it's masochistic for him, but like it doesn't have to be this like intensity at that level, but it should be intensity. Like what do you have? You have your energy and your effort and you have just the luxury, and I know it doesn't sound like this, the luxury of no expectations. If you have no expectations and you're not taking advantage of that and you're just fucking around at the bar or something like that, like, you know, do your thing. But like the intensity, understand what intensity is like because what you're doing is you're really leveling yourself out. You're realizing like, I've done that hard thing. I have it on my scoreboard. And now it's like this, this, this angry customer Okay, I got it. I can handle it. You're building your emotional resonance. You're building your physical resonance and you're ultimately building just your intellectual resonance to push things forward. I could talk to you for hours. There's so much I want to cover, but thankfully we will, with God willing, do a part two of this someday because dude, you, this is incredible. This is one of my favorite episodes. I hope people got to this point and realized that as well because I'm left inspired, so much knowledge, and I'm so much more interested in life, even though, Good. you know, I already am very interested in life, obviously, but you bring the passion and the, and the knowledge. And so thank you so much for, Appreciate for that. being you. I like to end these podcasts with a challenge. I ask the guests for a challenge to point to the place in their heart. They believe people should take the conversation and actually do something with it. Does a challenge come to mind? For them? Mm -hmm. For someone listening. I'll take a challenge as well. It's always sad when you know it's coming and you still don't have a good, perfect answer at the top here. I think that the first step we talked a lot about, and it's e easy, easy for them to do. If you're listening to this, even if you've done it before, this weekend or within the next week, let's say, take 90 minutes to yourself. Think about what you want. Write it out on any axis, anything that comes to mind. What do you want out of life? And if it's helpful, what do you want to have done by the end of your life? Edit that down as much as you want and then share it with three closest people who are going to give you good feedback. So that doesn't necessarily mean your mom or your best friend who's always going to love you and all these other things, but it does mean the friends who are like what I would consider real friends who are going to be direct with you and not give you feedback like good or bad, but like challenge you on it or at least are going to be good friends in the future to push you towards whatever that, that goal is, which might change, but at least for now, they're going to help you out in the next two to three years. That's the smallest thing you can do to better yourself. I love that so much. Patrick Campbell, at Paticus on Twitter. Sign up for this man's email list linked below. Is there anywhere else we should send people? connect with you that's great i'm on linkedin but i don't check linkedin messages so uh find me on twitter or um if if i can be helpful i'm in a season of help right now and so um i am going to give out my email address but respect it please no sales but i, I want to help um it's just pc at paticus.com so i'm small enough now that i can do that and as soon as my email is crashed hopefully a few years so it'll, it'll be something where uh, i'll have to change my email address but that's all right People are going to be listening to this episode in 2025, hoping that they can email you and yeah, yeah. be out of luck. It's going to be like, this is a deprecated email. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's good. Thank you so much for spending Absolutely. some time here with me today. It was such a pleasure, and I'm so grateful for you. Thanks for having me, brother.